Uh, it's my pre pleasure, rather, to introduce our guest speaker, Professor Milos Popovich, whose subject will be neuroplasticity, overcoming paralysis using electrical stimulation. And I must say, during lunch, we had a rather interesting uh, discussion with him. Dr. Popovich is a scientist at Toronto Rehab, uh, which is part of the University Health Network, and also an associate professor in the Institute of Biomaterials and Biomedical Engineering here at the University of Toronto. His research interests are in developing neuroprostheses for stroke and spinal cord injury patients, brain machine interfaces, assistive technology, and neurorehabilitation. He received his doctorate in mechanical engineering here from the University of Toronto and holds a diploma in electrical engineering from the University of Belgrade. So please join me in welcoming Dr. Thank you very much. And he, he did say he will, he will accept questions during the presentation as well as after the presentation. Thank you very much for having me. Can you hear me? Well, this is, yes. okay, okay. That's good. So, um, this is a little bit unusual topic. I don't. This is not type of things you usually see on TV or in <laughs> commercials. So, uh, I hope you will enjoy it. It's it's very different and it's hopefully exciting. So, very important thing is I started a company a couple of years ago. It's called MindTech. So, some of the things that I'll show you today have been commercialized. All the results that we have uh, published have been actually published before the company started. So this conflict of interest is a kind of funny thing, but I have to tell you so that you take it with a grain of salt, whatever I tell you related to the company and the product. Product is called MindMove. Um, so motivation. <coughs> I'm sure you know friends and relatives who had stroke, and here's an example of how that looks like. And this is just as the stroke happens. Why I'm showing you that? Because if you see someone in your neighborhood or your friends and relatives having, <coughs> behaving like that, you call 911 instantly, right? Oh, this has a sound. One second. She's Doctor feeling... said to breathe in, breathe out, man in distress, and I'm trying. I don't know why this is happening to me. It happened this morning again. And when I left the hospital Monday night at like 12.30 in the morning. So now I'm taking a picture for an example of what happens. It's 6.43. So for those who couldn't, couldn't hear what's going on, she's actually feeling that her face starts dripping on one side. And she's slowly losing control over the hand. That's why she's lifting and doing all that. So stroke is not instantaneous thing. So you start feeling funny, you have double vision, the things start kind of moving. And as a result, and what happens essentially, part of the brain is deprived from oxygen. Why? Because the, the vessel er, erupted or essentially is occluded and uh, slowly the function gets degraded with time. Now it's interesting in her, she had these episodes all the time, went to her MD and MD said, no, 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 you look perfectly fine. So the reason why she feel that because it's an episode number five, she had enough of explaining to her MD what's going on, so she okay, I'm going to film it. And then that's how this video came about. So after the stroke, this is what happens, right? So he had something similar. This is one of our patients. And 
he's having this hardware on his arm to protect him from injury and keeps his fingers straight, otherwise they will claw very fast. So why does he have all that? Because he doesn't feel his arm, he can't move his shoulder, elbow, wrist or fingers. And you can see Jennifer is now showing him what she would like him to do. And the reason why he's not doing it is not because he's cognitively not following, he just has no control over his arm. Okay? And you can see, he can't lift the wrist, that's a wrist extension, he cannot flex it, he cannot open his fingers, and that's very typical for stroke. Okay? So what happens when you have patients like that, and you run them through regular occupational therapy and physiotherapy, they stay like that. 10% may improve uh, by themselves or with the help of therapy, but the vast majority stays like that. Okay? So, here are some statistics. There's about 1.9 million people, people who have stroke in US, Europe, and Canada. And that's not the world, I mean, it's just a very small segment of it. About 50% of people die instantly. I'm not instantly, within 24, 48 hours or whatever the time is. 10% recover completely. They have a stroke, they have an intervention or something, you know, they, they, they get that very fast and they recover, or they just spontaneously recover because the stroke was really minor. Apart from this, this group, which has a spontaneous recovery, you have this large group which has some level of disability. So they can have either mild disability, or they can have moderate to severe disability where they cannot move their hand, they cannot walk. They kind of even stand up on their own. And there's those people who also have, besides motor impairment, they may have cognitive impairment. So they don't remember things, they don't understand what's going on around them. So the numbers are quite large. And as a result of that, actually stroke turns out to be the number one leading cause in all adult long-term disability. So these are the numbers associated with paying for that. This is what the government feels and sees on their accounts when they do the math. But nobody talks about the fact that patient who had a stroke, it's not that she had a stroke, her family had a stroke. Because her mother or her dad or her, her, her husband or children have to care for that person. So they lose their income, they lose their positions if they had intensive jobs, they have to change their home, everything changes. So it's the whole family has a stroke, not that one individual, which usually people don't think about. So these numbers, are just showing you some costs of burden of care for these individuals. Now what is interesting is not everything is spent on, on taking care of these individuals, but huge amount is. Because when you lose one head, you can't actually do things. And very simple thing is try to get a credit card out of your wallet while keeping one hand in a pocket. That's mission impossible. You're not going to do it or try to, put a, try to brush your teeth. Even though it is a unimanual task with one hand, you have to take the toothpaste, you have to scrape. Doing it with one hand, it's really not easy. To do. And there's many things getting dressed and out. So, many years ago, they started building this technology, which is called neuroprosthesis for grasping. And it was not done for stroke patients at all. It was done for spinal cord injury. Why for spinal cord injury patients? Because in stroke patients, at least they have the other arm, which is less affected. It's not that it's good arm, but it's less affected. And they learn how to deal with that one arm for most part of the day, and then the family is helping, but they cannot within both hands. But in spinal cord injury patients, they lose both hands. So there's nothing that they can do on their own. Nothing at all. So this is the, this is the basis of technology. You can apply. Very, this is skin of the patient, and these are kind of a nerves under the skin. So what you can do is you can two, put two little electrodes on the skin, and by applying very short electrical pulse, you can cause nerves to generate action potential. Action potential is a command which goes through the brain to the muscle to cause it to contract. So you can artificially generate that, and by providing these fields, you actually cause uh, these things which are called uh, gated sodium channels or potassium channels to open. And when they open, they create these action potentials which go to the muscle and cause muscle to contract. So you can artificially contract the muscle. Very easy. You just get electrodes like that, 
put it on any person, you provide those pulses, and you can get them to contract. Those of you who work with high power, you remember when you put your fingers in the wrong socket and that happened? It's the same thing. Just the amount of energy used is like a couple of thousands higher than it's needed to do this. Okay. So how does it work? So if you have this method in which you can, by very small or short pulses, generate muscle contraction, if you put these electrodes on all the muscles that you need to contract, and if you time them properly and you contract them in a proper test, you can get hand to open, close, you get people to walk with this type of technology. So what they thought of was the following. If I have this person who is fully paralyzed and will never improve, no matter what we do with that, why don't we build something like that, put it on their skin or maybe implant it in the body, and then the patient can use his or her own muscles to grasp and move things with the help of technology. So it's almost like an assistive device, right? And here's an example of the patient who has spinal cord injury. So this arm, so both arms are paralyzed. This arm has this neuroprosthetic system on the arm. And he has a little push button that he pushes when he wants to activate it. So I will show you what he's not able to do on his own. So he's trying to lift the tooth, toothbrush, toothpaste, and he can't do it. And he's using a trick, which is called tenodesis, but I'm not going to go into that. So even with tricks, he can't do it. And then he turns on the system, and he pick it up, manipulate it. And he can have different grasping styles, right? Now, this video is 20 years old. So it's technologically, there's nothing new there, right? There are other people who did it before us and whatnot. <coughs> But what is interesting is where the field was going, right? So this is where the field was going. We thought we were going to have patients who can't use their arm or arms, and then we will put the systems either on the surface of the body or implanted like that. And then the patient will activate that on demand. So when he needs to open a pit a bottle, beer bottle, then he will go press the button, open the hand, grasp an object, and manipulate it. And that's what we have been doing for the last 30, 40 years. We're all building those toys that people will depend on them for the rest of their lives. Okay? So this is, for example, another one which is external. It's surface. It's not implanted. So we did the same. You know, when you're in a room and you, you watch what the Romans do, you do what they're doing, right? So we build a thing and put it in the place, and we got... That's one of the patients. We got one of the patients and we put it to him. We trained him for many hours. And when he was told, totally competent how to use it, we said, okay, now you can go home and use it, do something with this. Meaningful, right? <laughs> and after a couple of months, he comes back and says, I, 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 don't, I don't need this anymore. Now, if you have ever used any assistive technology like a cane or a walker or anything, you know that Half of those things, you drop them and you, you don't want to use them anymore because they irritate you, you don't like the color, or complicates your life when you try to go to the washroom, or any of the above things. Or your, your nurse, your family member doesn't want to put it on, right? So we thought maybe that's the problem. You don't want to put it on because it doesn't look sexy, wrong color, or whatever, right? So they said, no, 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 it's all, all is fine. But, you know, the device is fine, but, but I don't need it. Oh, that's interesting, right? So I was an engineer. I just came from aerospace, started doing that. I had no idea what I'm seeing, right? So I go to my neurologist, uh, to Dr. Kurt, that was in Zurich. Good tag, good tag. What's wrong with this? Pictures. Oh, you're so unlucky. This patient had a spontaneous recovery. That's a great expression when you don't know what's going on, right? <laughs> <laughs> spontaneous recovery. <laughs> OK, so he had a spontaneous recovery. Few months, actually, almost a year later, patient number two comes, same story, right? I go to Armin, he's a serious guy, he's a, he's a top neurologist in Europe, right? So I said, what? what's going on? Oh, you're really unlucky. Uh, <laughs> it's another spontaneous recovery. Mm -hmm. We don't have this often, but <laughs> you really have a bad luck. When we have a third spontaneous recovery, I stopped talking to Armin because there's no point. I'm not going to teach me anything new. So then we said, okay, maybe we change the game, right? 
Maybe what we should do is not use it as a permanent orthosis, but use it as a therapy in which we will get the patient, design this customized device for them, and train them to nauseum to see how much they can recover on their own. Okay, so how does this thing work? So you have a person who cannot control his arm, okay? And then you ask them, I want you to open the head. And you put all the electrodes, like you can see it here, to open the head properly. And you tell the patient, okay, now open your head. And he can't. That's a male patient, he's struggling, he's trying to open the head, and nothing happens, right? And you let him struggle for 10, 10, 10 15 seconds. And he's working on it, he's sweating, you see the intention and, and attention to do this. And then you fire the electrodes you get head to open. And then you say, now I want you to close, like pick an object, close the hand around the object. And of course he can't do it because there's no movement whatsoever. And as he's trying to do that, you let him struggle a little bit, and then you fire another phase of the protocol and you get the hand to close. And you do this repetitively. But not only open and close, but also reach forward, touch your nose, all other things, right? And with time, they slowly start getting ability to do things on their own. It's not instant, it's not like, but it, session after session, you can see a little bit more of the range of movement, they get voluntary control over the muscles, and eventually they're able to do this on their own. So how does this really fundamentally work? That's the most important thing. So if somebody has a stroke, you either damage their gray matter or you damage their white matter in the central nervous system and you cannot generate a <coughs> command or you cannot send a command to the muscles that you want to control. So you cannot send the command through the central nervous system to spinal cord then to the muscle to, to control it. So we apply electrodes on not one muscle but multitudes of muscles and then we ask patient to imagine or to try to do particular that. And as he's struggling to do it, and not, is not able to send a command, we fire electrical stimulation exactly the same way as the brain will do it if it will try to do this on its own. The muscle contracts, and as this happens, there's a sensory feedback coming back to the brain, to the spinal cord and the brain, telling the brain that the movement has taken place. And as you do this repetitively over and over again, what happens is because brain is distributed system, it's not a PC, it's not like chip for motor control is here, but it's all over the place. You start using some other parts of the brain to relearn how to do this task. And a number of hours later, you have a new path, a new part of the brain matter which is controlling this task from scratch. So key elements here are this, patient, therapist, and the device. So, Let's start with the patient. The patient doesn't understand what's going on and what you're trying to do with the patient, this doesn't work. So patient has to be cognitively competent, which means you can tell them, I need you to do this, and they will understand what they need to do and what is the sequence of the task that they need to do. If they're cognitively not competent, don't waste your time. It's not going to happen because learning is a part of the process. Second thing is a therapist. The therapist has to know the patient, has to know what they can do, what they cannot do, and they, also know how to motivate them. They know how to put the electrodes, they know how to tell them a story, they know how to engage them. Very important thing. And also the therapist chooses which protocols you want to do with them. Give you a simple example. When I was in Zurich, I had this gentleman, he came, are you going to work? Yes, so what would you like to do? What motivates you? So the beer motivates me. <laughs> okay, and you're in a hospital, by the way. <laughs> So I said, beer cup. Yeah, if we will do this with a beer, that will be something exciting for me. Okay, so I crossed the street. Fortunately, in Zurich, you can buy the beer in a, in a superstore or even a pump station, by the way. So you, I bought a beer, crossed back to the hospital. So, okay, this is how we're going to do it. Each time you want to sit, you have to go grab the bottle, take a sip, not the whole thing. Sit, put it back in. <laughs> And he was going and doing it, and it's going great until the MD came, right? <laughs> That's a long story. And we need a device which can generate those movements. You need these movements to be sophisticated, and more, they have to replicate the way how the brain does it, otherwise it doesn't work. So that's one of the major advantages that we have because we have designed the technology that we can do that. There's no competition in the world presently that can do what we're able to do right now. So. Here, for example, placement of the electrode. So you can put an electrode right here, 
and this is a ground electron, and you can get the muscle to do that, right? So these are different pectoral muscle. This is biceps. This is, for example, hand opening. This is for flexing the fingers. So this electrode and that electrode gives you these two fingers to flex. Yes, please. How precisely do they have to be in exactly the right place? So the good thing is, any of you play violin? Mm -hmm. OK, so you know when you get a thumb and you just don't feel it's not sounding properly, you just move a little bit back and forth. You find it in real time. So the therapist knows which muscle she's looking for. She puts it right on the muscle, and she doesn't get it. She just moves it a little bit to left to right. Here it is. And then the best part of it, you ask the patient to remember where I had the electrodes yesterday. And they take the ownership. So when you come in, and so where do I put the electrodes? They go, here. <laughs> it goes very fast. So, and they get engaged in the process. It, there's a little bit of art to it. It's like, like cooking, right? But it's not so complicated. It's not like MasterChef Canada. <laughs> you can teach everybody how to do it, right? If engineers could do it, you can train a therapist. <laughs> so, so you can you also stimulate some of the muscles which are in the palm. So this is, for example, reaching forward, opening a hand, grabbing an object, retrieving. This is uh, uh, what's pinch grasp. This is a uh, lumbrical grasp, like that. Uh, or Kermit the Frog grasp. <clears throat> this is a pinch grasp, this is a lateral pinch grasp, and you can do it by manual. So you can do it with both hands, because if somebody's part of an injured patient, they need to pick an object, bring it to the hand, or take the tray with both hands, right? This is how the device looks like. It has 30 different protocols. There are 30 different reaching and grasping protocols that we train patients. Some of them are gross motor movements, so like touch your, mouth, touch your lips and retreat the pen back, or go forward, pick an object, or sideways, pick an object. Or you can have a pinch grasp or some other fine motor control things. This is the touch screen of the unit, and these are different protocols, and actually walks the therapist through the process. So if you have a therapist who is senile, no problem, it's just you need to do this, <laughs> presses, gets all the instructions, which muscles, what are the levels, what are the electrodes, and they know what they have to do which is good because sometimes you may not use particular therapy with many patients, and maybe three months later you need to use it, and you haven't used it for three months, so you just go in there and it tells you, and when you press this, for example, big tre begin treatment, you get these images of the muscles. So a therapist knows exactly where the muscle is, where it's innervated, so sh she would not use it, she would know where to put the electrodes and plant the therapy. So this is a 22-year-old young lady who had stroke, and this is like reaching forward, picking up an object, retrieving an object back. So this image, this was filmed before we created a product, but it gives you an idea how this is done, right? It's all surface electrical stimulation, so there's no, nothing invasive, you're not going through the skin, you're not going through the muscle that way, and the beauty of it is no side effect. So, when you pop your aspirin for whatever problem, you have some side effects each and every day. This has no side effects, right? Except the person who's doing this may get exhausted because the muscle sore. You've run exercise before, so you know, that, that's normal. Right? Okay? So we have done some clinical trials with that. So this is in stroke patients, they're subacute patients, which means they're about two, three weeks after stroke or more. And these are the methods of the study. So this is a randomized controlled trial. What does it mean? You take patients as they come, and you divide them in two groups. One group will receive the best occupational therapy that Toronto Rehab can offer today. And the other group will receive functional electrical stimulation therapy. This is what I was showing in the last 15 minutes or so. And they were all subacute. So this is called Shadow and Master Stages, stages of Water Recovery Score, less than two or less than two or Fugelmeyer score 15 or less than 50. In translation, they can't do anything with their head. <laughs> Nothing. They may be able to move a little bit of a shoulder or flex a little biceps, but touching something purposefully like that is impossible. Or touching the nose, or they can't do it. Okay? Why I'm telling you that? Because nobody wants to work with these patients. People work with patients who have much higher function, so they 
trying to extend them, they're already able to move their hand and they're trying to help them extend the range of motion. But if they cannot move their hand at all, they don't work with them. Okay? So here are the results. We had 21 patients, we had 11 patients in the control group and 10 patients in a stimulation group. And this is an important thing. This is an assessment which is called function dependence measure. This is what's used in the hospitals to decide when to discharge you. Right? So these assessments, and there's a particular component which is relative for us, is like self-care subscore. What can you do on your own? So they don't ask you, can you move the finger 10 degrees, which we engineers like to measure type of thing? They couldn't care less about it. The question is, can you feed yourself? So I put this plate in front of you, like we had it just 15, 20 minutes ago, and I give you a fork. Can you grab that fork and actually eat? If you can eat, you get a score. Yes. If you cannot eat, I don't know. You can't eat. Doesn't matter what you can do with your hand, right? So similar thing, it's bathing, dressing upper body, dressing lower body, grooming, right, or toileting. Score goes from 6 to 42, which just tells you that the engineer didn't design the score. <laughs> <laughs> but the second element which is important is, so 6 means they can't do anything, right? And if you have a change of 6 points, you have created a clinically meaningful difference. What does that mean in real terms? It means that before and after is sufficiently different that the medical doctor or the therapist will say, this was a meaningful improvement for the patient. Right? Because there's a lot of improvements which are not meaningful. So this is how they start. So six is the lowest score. So that's a minimum score. So you can see a lot of patients have very low scores. And this is a control group. This is a, our treatment group. And this is before, when they join the program. This is after. So these guys got eight points improvement on average, this guy's got 22 points. Now, don't forget that these people are cheating because they have the other hand. So when I ask, can you eat? Right? I can take my left hand and cut with my right hand, and I can eat with my right hand, not really using my left hand. Right? So this jump of 22 points is huge. Right? So it tells you that regular therapy is helping, but it's not changing the function, it's teaching you how to avoid the problem. So this is the same, same type of data, but you can see this is where the patient started in both groups, this is where control group ended up, this is where our treatment group ended up. You know, our, our scientific community is these days totally obsessed with statistical data and p-value. You can be, a, you know, Sheep herder, and you know which group you want to be. <laughs> you don't even know what the statistics is, or right? you don't care about that, right? which is important, right? So there's another one which is called Fugelmeyer assessment. That's very important. Clinicians use it all the time. It's this is upper extremity assessment, and they look at the shoulder, elbow, forearm, wrist, and hand function. So they're looking at what the hand is able to do, arm and hand, and they start from zero. The score starts from zero to sixty-six. And six points is that clinically meaningful difference, right? So this is where our patients start. And the reason why we stress this is less than 15, because people don't work with anybody who is less than 30. So if you have less than 30 score, you go to a therapist and say, oh, that's your score for your arm? Mm -hmm. Good, so we're going to work on balance. <laughs> <laughs> because there's no point. And you'll see it in a minute why there's no point to do it. So you can see there, many of them had zero scores. This is before, this is after. So look at how many people after 40 hours of therapy have no change. And this is one person who had change, significant and functional meaningful, and this person had a functional meaningful change due, due to the conventional therapy. Most, the other ones, nothing. And this is our group. So median gain here is zero. That's why when you have this level of disability in the hand function, nobody works with you because why would I put 40 hours into of therapy, which costs 100 bucks an hour, when I'm going, my median change is going to be zero. And then they can argue, maybe this guy had that spontaneous recovery. <laughs> 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 yeah. So anyway, so our change was 24.5 points on average. And some people, as you can see, jumped 40 points. So, so these are crazy kind of data. So here's the video. You remember the gentleman at the beginning? 
He couldn't do anything, could move his shoulder. That's all him. There's no electrical stimulation. That's him 40 hours later. It's not perfect, we don't play, it's perfect, but it's because functional, they can do something. So in his particular case, he went back to work, he was a juror, so he would go and hold rings or earrings or whatever he was doing with his right hand and then work on them with his left hand. So you don't need the conclusions, you got the message, right? So let's skip this one. <laughs> This is the most important thing, because when I was doing this type of therapy, right, people thought I'm doing some Serbian things, right? <laughs> <laughs> you, know, you, don't, you don't trust this ex you know? <laughs> <laughs> so we have, and that, that's, a, that's legit, I, I, I have no problem with that. So we have one of our medical doctors who is uh, authority in the field, her name, her name is Sandra Black. She came and said, why don't you give me, and she's very sophisticated, why don't you give me the system so we try it on my patient? Sure. Why don't you train my therapist and then? That, that's a very elegant way, very sophisticated. So let me see what, what are you doing, right? <laughs> so we trained her therapist, we gave her device, and off they go and they work with their own patient. <coughs> and this is the patient. This big 300 uh, pound guy had the ball and came running like straight at me. And it went horribly wrong. Uh, I, I, I immediately realized, well, uh, I, I have a broken face because my jaw was over here. It was so serious, they didn't know whether Andrew would survive the stroke. Well, we were fearful that we might never hear our son's voice again, or that he might not ever be able to walk again, or use his hand or arm. If somebody has a high-level stroke injury, probability of improvement is less than 10%. So basically with functional electrical stimulation, we are retraining function. One component of the signal goes to the muscle, but at the same time, we are also sending a signal to the brain of the movement that's being executed. They were saying that it would train the muscle, and, and my, my brain would obviously connect that pathway. Within months, we could see improvement. Very uh, encouraging, like we like saw hope. It did wonders for me. It pretty much gave me back my heart. If it wasn't for the functional electrical stimulation, he wouldn't be what he is today. It definitely has made a huge difference for him. Girl rehab and FES has been great for me. It's basically got me f from dependent to independent. Could you hear what he was saying? So that was it. And by the way, she was chronic by the time we got here. So she tried everything that she had in her arsenal, and she had quite a few tools, and he was not improving, and then he joined our program and did very well. So the next one is then, you know, X years later, we create a product, we launch the product, and the biggest problem was would that product scale when you send it out to the universe, which has never seen this before, has never stimulated people with electrical stimulation, would therapists be able to translate this technology to use it in their clinical <laughs> environment? So this is uh, part of the study. The study is much larger, but these are the data which became now available. And it's chronic stroke patients. They were more than six months after stroke. They were severely disabled. And they received only 20 hours of therapy. We recommend 40 and more. But the company decided, let's do 20 hours to see what happens. So it's a half of the minimum dose that we have recommended. And remember, the minimal clinical difference is six points. They need to change six points to have a clinical impact. So this is what happened. One to 24 individuals, right? These two individuals didn't do that well, right? This one and that one. But they got half a dose of the third. And you have... 14 out of 24, so it's 58% have improvement, which is greater than minimal clinical difference. These are people, therapists who deliver that. I never seen that. Many of them hated electrical stimulation before that. They thought it was 
some Serbian stuff, <laughs> and they didn't want to do it. So we trained them. I was not part of the training. So some, I trained some other people, then they went and trained them, and this is what we got. First time, as we roll the product out, so it's not like they have worked with this for 15 years now, they're masters and they can do some miracle things with it. It's just from the go. Okay, we don't know what we're doing, let's see what results we get. So very, very encouraging, very excited. So this is one of the patients who came to us, and he was 19 years after stroke. And by the way, he's financially very competent, let's put it that way. So he has therapy all the time, for the last 19 years. And his hand was in a good shape, he had no movement in the hand, but it was hanging down, he was doing very well. So he said, what about me? I said, you know what, you get, you're receiving therapy from the best therapist in the country for, in the province, for the last 20 years. I doubt there's going to be any change. I said, okay, well, let's give it a try. Because we never work with patients 19 years after. So this is after 20 hours of therapy. He was not able to move. His hand was hanging like this all the time. That was his hand, right? Or he had it in the sling. Okay. He was actually not wearing a sling because aesthetically it was not pleasing to him. But he had no function in the arm, right? This is him after 60 hours of therapy. So he further improved his uh, reaching, but now he's moving his fingers. So that's, that's him. And uh, just a couple of weeks ago, we had a tweet from another patient. This is Teresa. This is what she was able to, to write when she came. This is 13 sessions later, one, three sessions later. Okay, so. And there's more of the patients coming out of the woodwork telling you what they were able to do. So they're very excited, excited about this. This is an exciting thing. That's the journey. How actually this looks like, right? Because usually people think, oh, I'm going to build this, takes two years, and here you get results. Maybe three years, if that's all you need. Now that's about 20 years journey, right? And you're not yet out of the woods. So here it is. The whole thing started in 97, right? And the way how it started, I, I actually was, I was roboticist and aerospace engineer. Okay. And then I joined this team in Zurich, which was designing neuroprosthesis. So when I joined this team, my knowledge about neuron was as basic as my cat's knowledge. So I had to go <laughs> buy physiology books and what the neuron is, how is this connected, where is, what is connected to what, and how all that works, right? But one thing which I had advantage, because I, I, I knew nothing about the field, I came in and I realized that technology which they're using was not really appropriate. Because if you're in a field and you don't know what you're doing, you need to be able to do rapid prototyping. Design quick, fail quick, design quick, fail quick, until you figure out What's going on? While there's stimulators out there, which were existing in the 90s, right? You couldn't do it. They were built for one purpose only, right? And what you use the stimulator for that purpose, you cannot translate it to another function. So we decided we'll go and build a new stimulator, right? Took us a couple of years to figure out how to do that. And as we were doing this, this was very exciting, uh, we had an interesting event. There are two men in black came in, knock on the door saying that we're infringing on their patents. Mm -hmm. <laughs> that we are, you know, funny people. And that was happening in, 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 in Zurich. What actually happened was, we, were not, we didn't know that this, these guys existed. We didn't know that this company complex actually was real. And we didn't know that anybody in Switzerland made stimulators. That's how naive we were. But we actually chose to do it in the same way as they have done it. And we were publishing papers totally oblivious to what's happening just 300 kilometers away from us. And then they came to uh, teach us a lesson that you can't do this type of thing. Which is fine and justified. But then, you know, sneaky type of character, right? I said, so you're building stimulators. I said, yeah, we're building stimulators. What about we take your stimulator, as you have it, the hardware, but we change the software to turn it into neuroprosthetics. Because their stimulus were used for exercise purposes only. Mm -hmm. 
And fortunately, their engineer said, oh, that's a cool idea. Well, and we partnered with them. We got a grant, and we actually created the software to run that, to design any neuroprosthesis that your heart desires. So we can very quick design, in 15, 20 minutes, we can design a neuroprosthesis. Now it became a software game, not a hardware game. We can design prosthetics, test it, fail, do another one. And we could rapidly go and build different prosthetics. And we start working with patients and, you know, trying to see what kind of reaching, grasping, walking we can do with that. And you remember that thing, the aha moment. Ah, we don't have to actually make the prosthetic thing. We can do this as a therapy. So that was a very important thing. That happened in 2001. This is about the time that I came to trial. <coughs> and then we had to do clinical studies. So when you go to a medical doctor say, I would like to do clinical studies, and this is my technology and whatever, they look through you. Not at you, they look through you. <laughs> and the reason why is that, because clinical studies are complicated. They're very expensive. They require a lot of effort. They require a lot of time. And now you come out of nowhere, plus you can find the accent and you look like this. They're not, they're not going to work. Right? So I was forced as an engineer to learn how to run clinical trials. So slowly, you know, first trial, so we got the first population, we start looking good, then I got another population, looks very nice, then we start the first clinical trial, we got good results, we got another clinical trial, we got to get good results, that's okay. And we're learning the process, right? Because the process is not gentle or easy, just that we're on the same page. And then we decided to go to do randomized control trial, which is the pinnacle, the most difficult type of trial that you can do. But it's necessary because if you cannot demonstrate a randomized control trial, then you don't have anything to show, right? So we did one randomized control trial, we did that randomized control trial, and all results were great. We published that. That's 2008, 2011, as they were coming up. And then we said naively, oh, now we're going to create a company, we're going to build a stimulator, and we're going to do great. Yeah, right. So we created a company, we had this silly name, it's called Simple Systems, <coughs> and nothing happened. We tried, we, we tried. We worked very hard, we wrote business plans and whatever, right? And we struggled, we, we couldn't do, we couldn't move the business forward. But we moved technology, so we were not static. We tried different patients, we tried, we changed some of the protocols, we, we were learning about this. And so at the moment, I run into this lady, her name is Diana Plura, and she was watching what we do, and, and immediately her judgment was, you know, your business plan really stinks. <laughs> so let me see your data. So she looked at the data, fortunately she's a PhD trained chemist, from the University of Toronto, and uh, she uh, worked at Harvard, and she was in, a, in a, worked for venture capitalists for a long time. And finally, she said, oh, I think we have something here. So she went, created a business plan, we resuscitated the company, and we started with <coughs> small funds, big funds, we created a business plan, we secured intellectual property from university, if you want to watch real Mission Impossible <laughs> movie, try to secure intellectual property from university and the hospital, independently. But if you try to do it with both, that's exciting. <laughs> okay? Tom Cruise cannot do this. <laughs> Not even close. So we managed to do that, and it was great. And then we had a private investment. We changed the name to the company. The company is now called MindTech. And we developed the product which you've seen it, and we launched the product in late 2014, actually early 2015. And now we're on a journey to get this to every single patient. So the two things that stand in our way, money. And money. And money. <laughs> <laughs> so if you know people who are familiar with, the, with these two words <laughs> and are willing to partner, please let me know. because. Fundamentally is this, we have a technology, it works, we have de-risked the company, it works very well, but we now have to produce large number of units, we need to move to US, we need to get FDA approval, and this is all money. It's, you just need time and money to do this. Uh, but otherwise it's looking great, that this is the product launch, which was in 2014, 
and you can go, you can find MindDAC or MindMove, you can find all the patient's information and data and some of the stories and I think those of you who have friends of relatives who had stroke or had spinal cord injury or had some other neurologic traumatic brain injury, you should really let them know about it. This is not cheap, I'm not, I'm not advertising this as a simple and cheap therapy, but it does the job as you've seen. And uh, so this is a very important thing. And, and I always make this pitch for UFT Foundation and Toronto We Have Foundation. The granting agencies don't like risky stuff. So when you tell them, now I'm going to create a therapy which is going to cure people. Yeah, right. <laughs> Why would you? Maybe tr there's 50 people who tried it, and they're much more intelligent than you. There's no way you're going to do it. So when you come up with these risky ideas, I'm going to come up with that. The granting agency essentially says, no way. This is where the foundation or donor comes and says, okay, you, you really look goofy. Yeah, I, can, I can see that. But, you know, let's try. So they will give you a little money, which can be, let's say, $50,000 or $100,000. That $100,000 at that moment in time is equivalent like $10 million to it. Because you go, and you go and check something which is high risk, high gain, and if it works, you can build on that. And it is always this new population studies. Like I wanted to try it on a patient. It takes me about $5,000 to test this per patient because I need a clinician, I need a medical doctor to watch for that, I need to do ethics documents, and I have regulatory things that I have to pay attention to that. So if I want to try on five patients, that's $20,000, right? And I need it, I, I have to pay the people, I, you know, it's, you need to do that. And then you, you find, okay, let's work in this patient population. Would it work in this patient population? So then you need another fifteen, twenty thousand dollars And as you, and this is the moment when foundation comes in and says, okay, here it is. And that's what saves us. Now when we have pile of data and we can show it to the granting agency, and there's no question that we know actually what we're doing, then they will come forward and give you $300,000, $400,000 or whatever. But they will not give it to you before you have some pile of data. So, and also granting agencies are crazy. So I'm not trying to be disrespectful to granting agency, but here's, a, here's an excellent example. We're not going to measure grading agency, but here's an example. Pediatric population, pediatric stroke population is 12 children in Canada annually. So there's no money. So why would we go to pediatric patients? Pure altruism. So you, because drugs are not tested in pediatric population, because it's difficult and it's complicated, so most of the drugs that our children get are off-label for children. So I want to enable my pediatric colleagues to be able to use this intervention. So you go to the granting agency and you tell them, yes, I have started a company, I am I'm a shareholder company, but this is really altruistic game because I want to demonstrate that this is going to work in children so that every kid in this country would be allowed to apply because I don't have it in my specification of the product. And this is for pediatric cases. I have it for adults, right? So that MD can comfortably prescribe it. And also I have to, you know, they're having smaller hands, the different current levels. I, I have to figure out how to do that in children, right? And the main complaint was that methods are great, everything is great, you know, but he has a conflict of interest, he has a money in the company, right? And he's going to make money with this. Well, actually, there's not, <laughs> you will never make money on pediatric patients. You can even make money on spinal cord injury patients because there's only thousands of them, right? The only place you can make money is stroke and larger patient populations, right? So. That's with the grant, because granting agencies are not the granting agencies. They give it to other of your peers. And your peers sometimes can be jealous, or can be irrational, or both. Or they just miss the point, right? That, that's OK. I mean, we're all human. We, we make those things. But now the competition is so stiff that if one person of these seven says, I think he is cheating, or he's doing something funny, or he's Right? That taints the whole process and you don't get it. And this is actually, so this is where actually the foundation comes in. And for example, we only do pediatric patients, we never get money. But then one of the foundations came in, here's the money, we run it on four kids, we have great results. 
And if we publish it now, kids can go through the process and get it. Right? Because they, at least there's precedent. There are four kids who got it, and it worked very well for them. Why don't we try with more? So these are those really important things. That's where foundation and new donors really uh, uh, make a huge difference. So while I was talking, you know, for last, this is how many people had struck just during this period of time. About a thousand people had struck during this one hour. So one hour. In one hour. That's reality check. So worldwide? Yeah. Worldwide, yeah. Okay. Still, that's one hour. So it gives a, you know, makes you stop and think about it, right? So if you can help these people in some fashion, even 20% of them, that's huge, right? Now I want to show you what else we have in the pipeline. There's all high risk. Yes, please. Excuse me. Can I just ask a silly question? Yes, please. You, if these people that are being helped by your equipment, why would they not be, uh, why could this not be funded by your government health care? So that's a very good question. So uh, there's a lot of people who do all kinds of different devices and offer different therapies. And government, because it's under financial stress, all the time by medical costs and expenses, they have to be very careful which therapies and interventions they allow to be paid for. Right? So they want to have really solid evidence. Right? So even though you have this evidence, they say, okay, I need you to run a study in multiple hospitals simultaneously and make it. And then if you have good results, then we will consider it. They don't say you will automatically get this type of thing. So we are part of the program, which is called Mars Excite program, which is funded by the government. And the purpose is to test the technology. And if it works, then you get this technology accepted by OHIP to pay for it. That's the intent. There's only one little catch. You as a company have to pay for it. <laughs> and it costs roughly a million and a half, maybe $2 million to run it. And a budding company like us, which is a startup company, running on angel money, $2 million, it's a lot. Now, if I would have this $2 million and I start this today, I would have in a year and a half, maybe two years, <coughs> have data to record this, and then every person in Ontario will get it. And if every person in Ontario gets it, it will trigger Quebec, it will trigger Nova Scotia, it will trigger uh, British Columbia, other provinces to come in, and maybe trigger <coughs> France, may trigger UK, may trigger other countries where they see the, the evidence. But I need to jump over that hurdle, and again, as I told you, the most important thing is money. I have my team, I know who are, the, who are the scientists who are going to run it. I'm not going to run it, because if I run it, I have a conflict of interest, but I have people who would run it, and who are independent, who are internationally well recognized and respected. The only thing that stops, and we have ethics documents, approved, everything is ready, it's loaded, ready to go, the only thing which we're missing is cash. But, but you are treating patients at this time with the system. Yes, but you're treating it in, well, the, in the clinics. In the okay. clinic. but, but strictly in the one clinic? No, in 18 clinics. 18. And so who's funding that? They have paid themselves, out of the pocket. It's automatic, you have to pay for it. You have to pay for it, out of the pocket. Is that exactly. covered by any of the supplemental insurance? However, or? insurance companies pay for it. Yeah. So if you had a car accident or you had injury at work, you can, with your therapist, apply and it's a couple of insurance companies pay for it. And also, work with compensation equivalent in, in Ontario is paying for that. But not if it's just a normal struggle. No. That's unbelievable. Sorry. But it's, so it's not carried by like my wife's teacher's plan, which is... No. Does it work better if you um, get it right away after a stroke? Yes, as opposed to absolutely. Days? The earlier, the better. The why, sooner, the better. Why is that? The muscles are still have an atrophy? Or <laughs> no, no, the, it's really not the muscles. It's actually the scarring tissue in the central nervous system. So before the scarring tissue creates, you can 
promote this regeneration process and the, the neurons start sprouting left and right and try to compensate for it. But if you try to do it two years later, the scar tissue has been created and bridging over the scar tissue is very difficult. Right? So that's one of the explanations. The second explanation is you learn how to do things wrong. You know, like if you were not had the privilege to learn how to play golf from a good trainer or coach, you definitely do it wrong. And now if you want to improve your game, you have to actually unlearn the bad method and then learn a new one. That's much more difficult than learning from from scratch. So there's all these elements in it, right? You've obviously had golf lessons. No, actually, <laughs> I, I don't know how to, I don't know what to do with the... With the we send the stick to it. Exactly. I'm, I'm not one of those. But it's a good uh, metaphor to explain it. Because a lot of people are into golf. I'm, not. I'm more into fishing. So. Okay. Are you interested in this or should we skip this? Oh, no. Okay. okay. So we do a couple of other things which we have in the pipeline. So you know everything about the therapy. Now, very important thing, if you may remember, is the patient has to participate in this, and has to think about it, and has to want to do a particular task. So the catch is, how do you know? Because right now what happens is the therapist is looking in the eyes of the patient, right? And kind of seeing if there's an effort, there's an attempt. And then based on that, she judges when to turn on the stimulation. But what if the patient is just straining to see the, the nurse over there, because she's very cute, right? So it's not really paying attention to the arm. You're firing in the wrong time, and the, the, the cognitive load is on something else, not on a, on a particular task. So the only way, and the other thing is, when, when you're thinking about the, the particular task that you want to do, your whole system is heightened. So if you get the movement right at that time, the probability for neuroplasticity retraining is much higher than when you miss this time. Window, particularly over there. So we have done some experiments, and you have to trust me on this because I don't have time to show it, that if you can record from the brain, and you know exactly the in moment that the intent has been created in the brain, and you fire electrical stimulation, that you have way better outcomes than if you just fire it by watching somebody in her blue eyes. <laughs> so, the, the next phase is this. Try to get recording from the brain, non-invasive, not drilling anything, just from the surface. Determine exactly the moment that the patient is thinking of moving the hand forward, and then you fire the stimulation to get the movement to happen, without using the push button. Therapist is there, she's participating, she's doing everything that she did before, but actually patient drives the movement. So, the catch is recording from the brain, from the scalp, and figuring out which kind of movement the patient wants to do is, has been mission impossible until we got Cesar. You need Mexicans, trust me. <laughs> Solve the problem, and this is the outcome. So, this is the patient. He's recording from his skull, right? And what you're seeing is that Cesar, by the way. And this is Aaron, uh, they're working together. So this hand is instrumented to, to touch the nose the next time. So he's going to think about that movement, and when he imagines that movement, you will see this light turns green. And when the light turns green, the stimulator goes off. So watch. That's what we did, April. First trials. Now. Now, what is interesting about this particular patient? We have run him through normal FES therapy. He received 20 hours of therapy, didn't improve at all. Then we brought him, gave him this. 40 hours later, he retrieved clinically meaningful difference. I was very excited. So, okay, so that's one thing. How, how do you know when he's? How do you know what he's thinking? So here's the catch. We, uh, when you want to perform the movement, uh, when you record from your brain, different frequencies 
have this event which is called event related desynchronization or, or ERD. So what happens is the frequencies just go dip down quickly, just about a second or half a second before the movement happens. Now what is interesting is different movements have this watershed drop in frequencies a different frequency rate in a different moment in time. So you have one signature for that, you have one signature for this, you have one signature for that, the different signatures. So you're watching all these frequencies, you're, you take the signal, you do FFT, you break it into frequencies, and you watch how the amplitudes drop. And depending in which order they drop, you know, ah, he wants to do pinch grass. Yeah, he'll pinch grass. He wants to reach forward. Yeah, he'll reach forward. Very nice. And by the way, it's not working perfectly. Not, nothing is perfect, right? But it works about 70%, 74% accuracy. So out of the 100 times the patient is doing that, 74 times is perfectly triggered. The remaining 25 is still doing it, like, you know, having a butt on the back and fire. But at least 75% of times, you're hitting it exactly in the right moment, in the per you have the perfect time. The other 20% you're a little bit off. The time will improve on the technology, but right now it's sufficient for the therapy. Right? And even if it's not perfectly working, it's sufficient to, to drive that every day. And we're very excited about it. Which part of the brain does that affect now? Because you said Ah, you're very good. You're excellent. So that's the good one, because you lost that part of the yes. brain. Now, what happens is you can get the same signal from the ipsilateral part of the brain. The part of the brain which is, so this part of the brain controls the right hand, this part of the brain controls the left hand. However, it's 85% of, of the control comes from this, for the right hand, and 15% from this side. One five. 85 from here, 15 from here, for the same hand. So yes, I lost this part, but I have this one which is in there. And as I want to move the forward, this 15% control, I can pick it up from this side of the brain and drive it. And does that increase? Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Because what happens, maybe you, you remember, I, I'm not going to go through the slides. You remember the gentleman which is lifting the hand for the first time after 19 years? You right. notice that he's lifting the other hand as well? Right. <laughs> yes. Because he's driving both hands with this part of the mm -hmm. hardware. And only later he learns how to dissociate that. But the first time that he's doing, he's doing it with both hands. And it's almost symmetric. But that's okay, right? What is important that he will be able to, this is my left hand, this is my right hand. Not the same day, but a couple of days he will figure out how to decouple that. This is another one. You know stem cells, everybody tells you about stem cells. The problem with stem cells, if you get them, you need them to go to where you need them to go. They don't naturally like to go to where you want them to go. They go where they feel like going, right? So what, what we do right now is take the stem cells out, we put them in a dish, we germinate them, and we put them where we want them to grow and do something. The problem is when you take them out and you put them back, you have immune reaction to them. So the ideal thing would be to if they're produced in the brain, and they are in the ventricles, to just drive them from there to where you need them to repair the brain. So, it's a long story, but I'll make it simple. What we can do is we can take electrical fields and get the stem cells to move from one, from wherever in the brain to another side of the brain. We can guide them like Pac-Man, you know? <laughs> <laughs> We've done it on, in a dish, we have done it on a slice, as we speak, we're trying it in a mouse. If it works in a mouse, you're in the game. Which means that somebody had a stroke, you know that stem cells are produced in the ventricles, you can put one electron in the ventricle, the other one where you want them to go, and you turn them on, and you get them going, while you're giving them the therapy. So as the stem cells come, and they become neurons, or astrocytes, or oligodendrocytes, you train them, now you have to do this task. So not only that you train them how to do the function, but you provide new material, new building blocks in the process. Uh, okay. This is very magnified. 
So this is, you see the cell is fighting, it's trying to get there. It's not like it's passively rolling, but it's pulling itself to get to the other side. You're very excited about this one. I think this is totally funky. <laughs> so if it works, it if it turns to work, that would be a huge break. Mm -hmm. This is another very funny one. So, I like to read, and I read, read a lot, and I, I, uh, I don't read love stories, I'm sorry. But, uh, <laughs> so one of the things which I was reading a few, few years back was how CIA and this type of yes. characters figure out if you're lying or not. So they had a team in the 60s and 70s looking at the microfacial expressions to find out if you're lying. So these guys knew that Bill Clinton had fun with Monica Lewinsky before we all figured it out because they just looked at it and said, oh, he's lying. <laughs> <laughs> and the reason why they knew is because they look at micro movements of, of the face. Now, these micro movements, we don't control them consciously. It's all emotional thing. That's why you, you, you cannot, it's very difficult to cheat. You have to really train, very well trained to be able to cheat. Now, what is interesting is, that was done in the 70s, so the video is not readily available. So there's a lot of images that they were doing and showing to the, the people who were working with them. And then in order to train them, they would try to teach them how to make those different facial expressions. This is depressed, this is sad, this is happy, this is whatever. So as they were training them to show the sadness, many of them had a clinical representation of depression. So as they were trying to get the facial expression for sadness, if they did it for a prolonged period of time during the day, they will have clinical uh, presentation, even for a short period of time of depression. So that's a, two sentences in the whole book of 300 pages. <coughs> wow, that's interesting. So then I went back and go through the book, and they, I discovered in the book that they have two types of smile. There's a genuine smile, which you do not control voluntarily, so when you're really happy, you can see it on the face of the person. Or you have CNN smile, which is totally artificial, has nothing to do with, with anything, right? So this is an interesting thing. We said, OK, let's try to ge generate this genuine smile, which you and I cannot do it unless we're really happy, with electrical stimulation. We'll stimulate this facial expression of the smile and see if this is going to change the mood. In so we got able-bodied subjects, we tricked them, because this is very painful, the stimulator which we used was very painful, and we wanted to find out if, when we provide this painful stimulation on the face, if we told them, we want to see how you're dealing cognitively with mathematics and cognitive tasks, when we induce pain on your face. <laughs> so we have people and they are they're squinting them, they're smiling, and they're feeling the pain, and they did mathematics before and after. And they thought we were checking their cognitive skills. No, we were not. We wanted to know if their mood is going to be changed if you generate the smile, even though it's, it hurts them. 15 minutes of electrical stimulation of the facial muscles can change the mood of the person, even if it's unpleasant. So right now, we actually got a patent a couple of days ago on this. We want to try to treat depression by stimulating smiling with electrical stimulation. Non-invasive, no drugs, no side effects, nothing. If that works, that's going to be great. What if it doesn't work, at least we have fun. What about the liars? Hmm? <laughs> <laughs> uh, they're not in that department. <laughs> but I can have just one, one slide and I'll, I'll stop. Oh, that's it. So if you want to find what else we do, that's our web page. Uh, Questions. We are really running over time. I see one in the back. Maybe one or two quick questions. Could this be applied to cerebral palsy? Uh, which one? The, uh, I was thinking of the original stimulation. Yes, that's what we, we actually have a study uh, with children. We have two who are in, uh, in trials right now. So we hope it, it will work for them. I do not know, but that's the, that's the hope. Uh, you must be familiar with uh, Tesla. Yeah, he's uh, yeah. yeah. 
he went through the same thing you're talking about because uh, he told when he was 17, he told his teachers, "You don't need that commutator or this motor." They said, "Forget about it." He came to New York with Dr. Thomas Edison. Edison, Edison told him, "Forget about it." So he went to George Westinghouse, and George Westinghouse brought the AC three-phase system into being. Yeah. So you, your story sounds much like his. Yeah, but he was a he was a bigger man. <laughs> I, I'll ever be. He was stronger. I just. Uh, Never but you're just beginning. <laughs> <laughs> right. Yes, I have a question. Is your electrical stimulator approved and registered with FDA? No, with Health Canada. So it's available in Canada and anybody can get it. For FDA, we are preparing materials and uh, planning submission. Yeah. Everybody can get the stimulator or treatment using the stimulator at one of the 18 clinics that provide it. Yeah. Right. But, Excuse me, you can also use it yourself. No, no. It has, to be, it has to be done with a therapist. You need a person who knows how to do this. Could I suggest we wrap up? Obviously, there's a lot of questions. Are, are you available? I'm I, available. I, I sense you're anxious and quite willing to stay behind and, and chat with people. Sure, absolutely.